Good morning everyone, um, I'm going to be talking about the posture and medial corner of the knee which has been um, described in the literature as the neglected corner and the reason we've uh, picked this topic is there was a review article in um, JOS this month um, looking at the anatomy, pathology and management strategies. Uh, so extensive research has traditionally focused on the evaluation and management of posterolateral corner of um, the knee and there's a lot of less literature that's focused on the medial side, specifically this posteromedial corner. Um, the expert pioneer in the area of posterolateral um, corner knee injuries and management is uh, Robert LaPrade and that's, uh, this is him hanging up on the wall. Um, he's written papers about the posteromedial corner but not to the extent of the posterolateral. So why is this how, why has this corner been neglected? It's likely due to uh, differing anatomical perspectives of physician authors um, and also the functional significance that they assign to the structures um, in this posteromedial corner. Uh, so Warren et al, he divided the uh, medial side of the knee into three layers from superficial to deep, looking at the uh, layer one is the deep fascia, layer two is the superficial MCL and layer three is the joint capsule and deep MCL. So in this late approach, little attention is actually um, paid to the, the structures that are lying in the posterior aspect of the knee. Um, a more recent description in the uh, literature by Robinson just divides the side of the knee into thirds, so anterior, middle and posterior third. Um, and the superficial and deep portions of the MCL actually occupy uh, the middle third of the medial side of the knee. And although they function in close association with the structures of this posterior um, medial corner, they are not typically considered part of it. So what's, what are the structures that we're going to be talking about? So I'm going to go into these in a little bit more detail in my um, upcoming slides. But they include the semimembranosus tendon and, and its expansions, the oblique popliteal ligament, the posterior oblique ligament, the pos posterior medial joint capsule, and the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. Uh, so the posterior medial corner is also called the um, semimembranosus corner due to the important role that semimembranosus tendon has in providing dynamic stability of the knee. So here are the five different arms. Um, they're just labelled around here. Um, so the pars reflexor is the anterior arm. The direct posterior medial tibial insertion is the primary attachment of semimembranosus. Um, the OPL insertion re reinforces the posterior capsule. Um, the POL insertion is the capsular arm and the popliteal aponeurosis expansion is the inferior arm. So uh, there's a better picture that shows all this together in a minute. Um, then there's the posterior oblique ligament, which is also known as the ligament of Winslow. Originally, this ligament was described as part of the MCL um, in 1943, but later, this posterior portion was described as a ligament actually distinct from the superficial MCL and was named the posterior oblique ligament by Houston. The posterior oblique ligament originates um, near the adductor tubicle, so it's got a different origin to MCL. Um, and this is quite controversial in anatomical studies as these three arms um, here, uh, may not be separately discernible and they actually blend with um, the joint capsule itself. The central arm is the largest and thickest of the three arms and reinforces the posteromedial joint capsule um, and adheres to the um, posteromedial aspect of the meniscus and also to the articular surface of the tibia. So Laprade suggested that this arm, the central arm of the posterior oblique ligament is the main structure in this area needing repair or reconstruction after injury to this posteromedial corner. So this um, picture just shows those two um, ligaments um, together at, in this posteromedial corner. So the five arms that we talked about of the semimembranosus expansions and the three arms of the posterior oblique ligament. So moving on to the oblique popliteal ligament or the OPL. Um, this is a broad fascial band that crosses the posterior aspect of the knee and is difficult to distinguish again from the, um, the joint capsule. It arises from the capsular arm of the posterior oblique ligament and the lateral expansion of the semimembranosus tendon towards the lateral femoral condyle. Um, so it's actually part of both the posteromedial corner and the posterolateral corner and this MRI slice shows the arrow pointing to that. 
And then the last two aspects are the joint capsule and um, the posterior horn of the medial meniscus. So the, um, the joint capsule is part of layer three and forms that deep MCL um, with its meniscotibial and meniscofemoral components. Posterior, the, posteriorly, the capsule is reinforced externally by the posterior oblique ligament, which we've discussed, and also that expansion of the semimembranosus. The posterior horn of the medial meniscus um, is intimately linked with all of these structures, all five of the structures. And the relationships among these structures are critical to the, the dynamic stability of the medial side of the knee and act as like a cascade system. So uh, the function of each structure depends on each other because they're all um, attached. Okay, so looking at the uh, functional anatomy of these structures in the knee, what, what are they doing um, for us? So um, the posterior medial corner and their pos posterior oblique ligament, in particular, are biomechanically separate structures from the superficial MCL, and the PMC is a primary stabiliser of the extended knee. Um, it does the load-bearing position of the knee and gait, um, and it provides approximately one-third of the restraint to valgus stress uh, which, uh, of the knee in extension, and in flexion, the PMC slackens and then the MCL takes over throughout that arc um, for, the, for valgus stress. Um, the posterior oblique ligament is a primary stabiliser for internal rotation um, at the knee um, in all angles across the arc, um, but the most of the load occurs in full extension. And al also in full extension, the posterior oblique ligament helps to prevent posterior tibial translation and valgus abduction, even when you've got an intact um, PCL. And it also functions in a share loading manner with MCL for valgus stress across all, all movements. So um, in terms of looking at the, pos the posterior horn of the medial meniscus, um, in the literature it's described as having this break-stop mechanism so that the, um, the tibia doesn't translate um, anteromedially. So um, it's like this passive support um, that, that stops that. So when there's um, issues with that posterior um, medial horn of the meniscus, you can get um, ant anterior tibial translation on the femur. So looking at the injury patterns for this, um, uh, for the posterior medial corner, so there's no classification system available um, and frequently this um, structure is injured in, with other ligaments in the knee. So it's usually a multi-ligament injury. Um, there was a study, a retrospective cohort study in 2004 where authors reviewed the charts of 93 patients um, with operatively treated, isolated and combined medial sided knee injuries and they described the associated injury patterns. So 99% had this posterior oblique ligament injured, um, they, um, about two thirds to three quarters had um, injury to the capsular arm of the semimembranosus tendon and um, there was in one third of these patients, complete peripheral meniscal detachment. And that's the paper there. So what, what's the mechanism that causes these injuries? So uh, usually a contact valgus force to the affected knee is most commonly um, occur, like is, is the reason why patients get this injury and it's often during sports. Um, Non-contact injuries usually result in low-grade sprains, whereas a direct blow obviously would produce a more major valgus force um, and a high-grade injury, as you would expect. And a pure valgus force often cause, causes just an isolated MCL injury. And uh, patients who have an external rotation and valgus force combined are most likely to injure the posterior oblique ligament and also other components of the posterior medial corner. So what are we looking on history for these patients? So again, the, typically the sports um, that these injuries will occur in is football, skiing and basketball. Um, often uh, patients were hit by cars um, or in motor vehicle accidents. It's often that valgus force or they describe a direct blow to their lateral knee. They might hear a pop. They have side to side instability um, on mobilization. And often these, the uh, patients will have had a knee dislocation, so in that multi-ligament knee injury. Uh, so here I've got a video. Uh, so this is Rob um, Gronkowski. He's, he plays NFL for the New England Patriots, and he sustained this knee injury in 2013. So the media reported 
reported it as an ACL and MCL ligament ruptures, but I suspect that he's likely to have a posteromedial corner injury. Let me uh, just see. Yeah. Yeah, that ended his season. It did actually. <laughs> it was devastating. Um, do you want me to go back? No. No. Okay. <laughs> um, so, um, anteromedial rotary instability is this hallmark um, in, um, of a PMC injury. So, it, it's defined as um, anterior subluxation and external rotation of the medial tibial plateau with respect to the femur. So, I'm going to go through how you examine for this. So, um, AMRI can be identified by applying a valgus stress at 30 degrees of knee flexion while the foot is um, externally rotated. Um, so, holding the plantar surface of the foot instead of the distal leg helps you appreciate um, that rotary component. So, a positive test results um, in medial joint, joint space gapping and anterior subluxation of the medial tibial plateau um, relative to the femur. And this um, correlates with a combined posteromedial corner injury and MCL injury. You can also do an anterior draw test. Uh, so I'll get this. So this is uh, used also to evaluate suspected AMRI. This test is performed by flexing the knee to 90 degrees while externally rotating the foot uh, 10 to 15 degrees. And again, it's that subluxation of the tibial plateau, um, which indicates an injury to the um, posteromedial corner. So I, I'm going to go on to what those mean in regards to other ligament injuries in, in a minute. What I mean is it's not in itself Yes, so yeah, I'll, I'll go into that in a minute about how you differentiate between just a um, PCL injury and then com a combined injury with the um, posterior medial corner. So other examination techniques. So <coughs> it's really important, obviously, to test other knee ligaments because it's a multi-ligament injury. Um, we need to do a careful neurovascular um, exam as well because um, often this is in a patient who's had a knee dislocation. Um, we need to... Um, differentiate between the MCL and PMC injury and the way you do that was instead of having that external rotation obviously you have the foot in neutral um, at 0 and 30 degrees of flexion so and the opening valgus with the valgus stress um, and valgus opening at full extension should raise suspicion not only for a cruciate ligament injuries but also to, for damage to the posterior medial corner and then now this is what you were asking, Mr. Hoare, about the PCL injury. So a posterior jaw examination should be performed with the tibia in neutral and in and internal rotation as well. So comparing the two. So in an isolated PCL, there'll be decreased posterior tibial translation um, with the tibia in internal rotation because that the posterior oblique ligament helps um, hold it in place. Whereas um, when you apply that, when you put it back in neutral, it'll feel like a, a, a larger um, translation. So in terms of imaging, so obviously we're going to get plain films. Um, if this injury is chronic, we'd look at doing stress views and also weight-bearing views. Um, we want to, we, you may need um, to get a CT for, to look for fractures as well. Um, and in the acute setting, a CT angio for a, an acute knee dislocation and obviously MRI is going to show us the soft tissues. Now, what do we do with these patients? So um, there's a paucity of literature on this topic um, and there's no agreed upon techniques or indication for surgery. Um, all, everything that I read was case series, so there's no comparative. Um, so I'll just go through what the review article has recommended from JOS. So um, looking at non-op um, reconstruction and repair. So non-operative patients, that would usually, um, that would be for patients who've just um, injured their MCL and this would be isolated, you know, grade one or two um, that may extend posture immediately and that would include a short period of bracing and physical therapy. Uh, surgical candidates, they talk about having uh, patients who have relative incompetence of the posture medial structures in the context of a knee with multi-ligament injuries um, and also those patients who've got um, 
a chronic symptomatic um, instability with their knee. And then we need to think about um, whether it's in the acute or chronic setting, whether we do a stage procedure or do it in one sitting. Um, and this will really de be determined by what the soft tissues are going to allow us to do um, and the range of movement of the knee. Um, so in the JLS article, they recommend that um, all patients who are undergoing surgery for this injury should have a thorough examination under anaesthetic. They should have a diagnostic arthroscopy regardless of the method of their surgical management. Um, and this is, you know, to assess for meniscal pathology and also the articular cartilage should be assessed as well. So moving on to repair. So um, the MCL must be repaired in conjunction with the posteromedial um, corner. And they describe a kind of dealer's choice in terms of fixation methods, whether you suture anchor staples or um, screw and washers, um, making sure that you approach your um, the structure systematically from deep to superficial, and particularly evaluating the posterior oblique ligament and semimembranosus. So um, there was a systematic review done in 2015, published in Arthroscopy, uh, which looked at the, the repair of medial collateral ligaments in conjunction with that posterior medial corner injury. Um, and they showed, again, this was just a case um, series, that, uh, that most of them were just case series, um, that showed that there was effective and reliable treatment for these medial-sided knee injuries and they re resulted in improved valgus stability and patient-reported outcome measures. Um, there were low rates of secondary failure, but they kind of compared apples with oranges. They were a, a wide variety of techniques. Um, and then moving on to reconstruction. So there are multiple methods of reconstruction that have been described in the literature. Um, so um, they recommend a use of allograft tissue to limit donor site morbidity. And um, they, they quote this paper by Laprade, um, who's the kind of guru in this area, um, who looks at an anatomical reconstruction and this is, um, I, I, I think that this might be, it looks like autograph to me, but I'm, I'm not 100% sure. They didn't really mention in the paper. But they used two separate grafts, grafts to reconstruct um, the superficial um, medial collateral ligament and the posterior oblique ligament. And um, this, again, was a case series study where they had improvement in patient reported outcome measures. They eliminated that side-to-side -side instability in all patients and had an average of 1.3 millimetres of increased medial compartment gapping post-operatively post versus 6.2 millimetres pre-operatively, and this was measured on stress radiographs. So, take-home messages. Um, the, so, the posteromedial corner injuries uh, rarely occur in isolation. They're often multi-ligament injuries. They're associated with injuries that dominate the clinical picture and may mask injuries to the posteromedial corner. Uh, this anteromedial rotary instability is a hallmark feature of uh, PMC injuries, and it's um, an important primary stabiliser of valgus laxity and a secondary stabiliser of anterior tibial translation and external rotation. So it's in, uh, a lot of the papers talk about how important it is to address these injuries to prevent graft failure and multi-ligament um, reconstruction and injury can result in uh, chronic valgus laxity, but there are evolving treatment strategies and we're not quite sure what to do with them just yet. Thank you.